So welcome everyone. Uh, today we have uh, we, uh, we have uh, Alexandre Gilliot from uh, Criteo uh, talking. Uh, Alexandre is um, uh, I've been told is a bit of a legend from one of his colleagues. <laughs> Uh, for knowing the intricate details and tricks of making machine learning work in production and getting positive A B tests, right? So uh, I repeat what I heard from colleagues from Crito, uh, IT team of uh, Alexandre. Uh, so Alexandre today is going to uh, show you can uh, uh, aggregate uh, data and learn from aggregate data. So uh, Alexandre. Uh, you have the floor. Uh, just before you start, let me remind everyone, if you have questions, just type your question in the Q&A box, and I will interrupt the speaker. Uh, I'll try to uh, unmute you. Uh, in case it doesn't work, I will read the question in your stead. OK, and Alexandre will uh, reply. OK, Alexandre. OK, perfect. You can talk. Thanks a lot. So. As the title says, I'm going to talk about how we can learn a model when you have access to only aggregated data. So first, aggregated data, what does it mean? Um, usually in machine learning, we have some data set which is presented line by line, and every line fully describes one example with several features and one label. And in the case we will, I will um, be interested in, the features will be all will all will be some categorical features. I will just get a binary label. Could be extended, but that's my setup. And this data set can be aggregated as follows. For example, I could select a subset of features, for example, feature one and feature two, and simply count the number of examples on each possible pair of modalities of feature one and feature two. And I can also count the number of labels with the, lab, the number of examples with a label of one, so just the sum of labels because it's binary. That's one way to aggregate. Of course, this data set uh, can be aggregated in different ways. For example, I could count the examples and labels grouped by feature two and feature three. Or if I'm still stick with um, pairs of features, I could also have this table. So in general, what I will call aggregated data will be a set of contingency tables, like those three tables, which provide some counts of examples and some sum of labels on several subsets of the features of the original data set. Um, in this work, and more specifically in the experiment I've been running, I was I was directed myself to a case where I have exactly one table for each pair of features. So in these examples with only three features in a data set, it means only three tables. In general, it's uh, quadratic in the number of features. And to give you an example, the largest data set where I tried was something with um, about 19 features, which meant about 200 aggregation tables. So the problem now is, can we learn a model predicting the probability that the label is one knowing all the features and learn this model when we have access only to tables like this and not access to the line by line data set. So that's the problem we want to, to investigate. So I will have one slide about advertising, which is the to explain why we are interested in this problem at Criteo. Um, to put it quickly, you probably know that there are some changes to the advertising environment which are coming uh, with the privacy sandbox from uh, Google Chrome. And Chrome will remove the third party cookies will, will, which will prevent us to collect the kind of training set we need. Um, but they will provide us some tools to still do some more uh, retargeting and to make things um, simple, let's say. They will, provide a they will provide us a tool where we would be able to access most of the features we have today, but only on the browser of a user. And we would have to upload our models on the browser 
and then it would be applied in a kind of black box where we would not be able to see the data and hopefully according to them at least well uh, everything would be fine the only detail is that the training set that we collect today to learn this model that we need we would need to upload is something which contains some uh, information on um, well some cross-domain information on the user for example one line which describes one display could have some information on the website where the user is right now and some information on the behavior of the same user on another website such as uh, one of our partners and because of that Google would not give us access to this kind of data. And instead, they tell us that we would get, well, aggregated data. So tables containing number of displays and number of clicks on um, several projections of the data. So the question now is, if we have just that, can we learn a model predicting probability of a click, knowing the partner, the URL, the size of the banner, so the user context, and um, many other features. Okay, that's our motivation. Let's come back to the abstract setup with just uh, feature one, feature two, and so on. Um, okay, first one thing, what we cannot do with this kind of data. Okay, you can forget basically all the classical supervised learning models. So all deep learning, logistic regression, random forest, unless you restrict your, yourself to each, each tree with only two features and so on, there's just nothing which works. What you can do is, okay, maybe some stupid things like, yeah, in this case, you have three tables. If you use only one of those tables, maybe the first one, you have feature one, feature two, some, uh, some counts of examples and some sum of labels. Okay, that's enough to learn a model like this, which predicts the probability of the label knowing two of the features. So you can do that, problem is, if you have, let's say, 19 features and you use or can use only two, probably it won't be very good. You can also do some average of such models. For example, if you do random forest with only two features on each tree, but it's um, not very good either. Okay, another possibility is something which is called knife bias, which you probably already know. Um, to remind quickly what it is. It's a model which makes some independent assumption between the different features. For precisely, it assumes that all the features are independent during the label. And because of that, you can write the, with this assumption, you can write the, the probability of the joint features X and Y as a product. And if you are able to and those terms can be estimated directly from those tables. Actually, it can be estimated from something even simpler than that, because to do to estimate this, you only need tables with one single feature and the count of examples and the number of lab, sum of labels on the realities of this single feature. And well, if you have uh, this table, of course, you can uh, re-aggregate to marginalize on one of the features. Train this. And so this is the joint distribution of an X and Y. You just apply a um, well based formula and you can find the conditional distribution, um, which is the predictor of naive bias. So, naive bias, the good thing is it is simple. The problem is it doesn't perform very well. And the explanation of why it doesn't perform very well is basically. It assumes some independences between the features. And on true data set, those independences are typically quite wrong. And to finish, there's a thing, one thing which is a bit sad about using naive bias with this setup, which is that we, it does not use at all the pairwise data, actually. It only requires tables with one single features. And here we have the data to check that the independence assumption are wrong because we observe the correlations between the pairs of features. So if some pair of features is correlated, we know it from those tables 
and assuming that it's independent seems a bit, um, well, a bit sad. The question is now, okay, what do we do? And before I answer that. Alex, sometimes there's a, there's a sound that I, I don't know what's happening, but is it maybe it's your hand or something? Oh, um, is there something I should repeat? No, 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 I think it was clear enough. Just maybe if you're moving your hands, don't. Okay, um, sure. <laughs> I, I don't hear anything myself, but. Uh... Oh. Um, no, no, I mean, I hear you well. I mean, I don't, I okay. don't hear any oh. problem like okay. David. <laughs> you got me scared. So yeah. let's continue. And if there's yeah. any issue, you tell me. Um, okay, so before we start to make, build the model, let's give a slightly more formal definition of those, aggreg of, of those aggregated data. And so we'll have some, an observed data set made of features vectors X and labels Y. We assume that they are identically distributed and independent from some distribution that we do not know. And we'll define one mapping from the feature vector to a large um, binary vector, which is defined as follow. Um, okay, for one feature vector, made of in uh, this example, just three features. Um, so it will be defined by one out encoding all the pairs of modalities of the um, uh, of uh, each pair of feature. So we have the our feature vector here, and we build all the pairs of features um, from the possible from this data set. So there is the pair feature one, feature two, which has modality 42 and B. And we want to encode this, which means that for every possible modality, we have one um, dimension in our binary vector. And somewhere in the vector, there is the dimension for feature one is 42 and feature two is B, and you will write one there. And there's all the um, a list of dimensions which are for the possible modalities of feature one and feature two. And we have exactly one, one somewhere in this range and zero on all the other um, possibilities. And then we have another um, range of, of uh, dimensions for the encoding of feature one and feature three. And finally, a range of dimensions for the encoding of feature two and feature three. So, there are several, this is some, typically what you get when you want to encode what is called cross features in a logistic regression. Or one way to see this also, and that's why it's called quadratic kernel, is to say that you will not encode all the features, you can concatenate everything in one vector, and then you make um, the square of this vector, so you get a matrix, which you unroll to get a vector. Um, anyway, what's the link between this construction and our aggregated data? It's pretty simple. It's, it's um, because actually there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the dimension of my encoding and the rows of a table. So actually that would be another way to construct this, which would be to say, to say which would which would be to, to say that um, I make a vector whose size is exactly the number of rows in all my tables. And then for each table, so I have an example X, for each table, I will look in which line of a table it is counted. I write a one at this point and some zero in the other dimensions. So it's mostly zero and there are some one one for each table. I hope I didn't lose you there, sorry. I no, I was a bit messy. Um, but once we have been defending, defending this, the aggregated data are quite simple to define because it's simply, uh, well, to get the aggregated counts of examples, you simply sum the encoding of all the vectors of a data set. And so the vector D is simply representing the aggregated counts from the tables. It's exactly also what you get if you uh, just take all the tables um, on top of, uh, um, you, you put all the counts from all the tables in one single vector and you get this. 
and the detector C will be the same thing, the sum of the encodings of all the vectors of the data set, but you multiply, we multiply by the label. So it could be also the same thing to make the sum only, only on, the, on the examples with a label of one, because why is, why is the binary? And so this is the mathematical definition of our aggregated data. Okay, so now that we have defined this, let's see how we will try to learn a model when we observe D and C. And what we'll do, we'll have some probabilistic approach. We'll start by building a model. So what we want is a model which predicts the label Y knowing X. Problem is that we cannot do that directly. So instead, we'll make a join model and the distribution of X and Y. Why do we build such a join model? Because if we have a model uh, of um, X and Y, then now the aggregated um, data that we observed, so small d and small c, we can see this as the, aggregation, uh, so the realization of the random variables big D and big C, which are defined as follow. I take several copies independent of X according to my model, and I just make the sum of the encodings of um, those X. That's the vector on D. And the definition of um, C is um, similar. So now, what I observed was just a realization of the random variables D and C. So to train, I would like simply to try to, once I've defined this parametric model, I would like to retrieve the parameters which maximize the probability of the observed event with D equal small, small D and big C equal small C. I'm just trying to maximize the probability of what I observe according to the model. Okay, but what I want is a model to predict the probability of Y knowing X, but if we have this, it's quite straightforward because it's just a base formula or basically the, directly the definition actually of a probability of Y knowing X as uh, this ratio. Okay, so now the problem is that for general parametric, um, this is typically intractable. So that's where we have to choose wisely which kind of model we want to, to take so that the training is reasonable. And the model I suggest to take is something which we call the random Markov field. So I will explain in a few slides why exactly this model, but there are some good reasons to take this one. And it's a model with two vectors of parameters, mu and theta, which is defined as follow. Basically, it's um, um, some dot product, uh, well, an exponential of some dot products. So I compute the dot product between the encoding vector and the first vector, and the first parameter vector. And I add the dot product between encoding vectors and the second parameter vectors if the label is one. Else, well, else this is zero, of course. Um, okay, so I want a probability distribution. So of course, I will need uh, the sum on all possible x and y to be one. So there is a constant there to make sure that it's sum to one. This constant is typically intractable, but we'll see later uh, how we deal with it. Um, okay. Something which could be worth noting immediately is that this model is actually a kind of generalization of nice bias. Why is it the case? So if we assume that, okay, we define the encoding phi, and I told you that we had one table for each pair of features. We could have made the same construction in the case where we have exactly one table for each feature. And Firefox, in this case, would be simply the one lot encoding of all the features. And if we had been doing it this way, then this formula could be factorized 
feature by feature, and actually we would recognize exactly naive bias. So that's why it's important to have pairs of features because if not, it becomes something a bit too trivial. And let's continue. How do we predict when we have this um, with this model? So as we have seen, what we care about is the, to predict the properties of y equal one knowing all the features. Um, and the probability is this, applying the lower total probabilities, well, which is to say when we observe x, either y is one or it is zero. We replace everything there by the definition of the model that we had on the previous slide. Um, I didn't write the normalization constant here because it, it just uh, simplifies out. And then we can see that the exponential of pi of x dot mu is both on the numerator and on every term of the denominator, so it also simplifies out. And what's remaining is actually simply a logistic, so that the logistic function, function of phi of x dot theta. Well, let's write it again because that would be important. Um, the model we have looks like a logistic model with features phi of x. And with the definition of phi we have, it means logistic regression with all cross features, which is the, which is an interaction between all pairs of features, because that's how we have been building this vector phi. Okay, we certainly do not expect to do better with our model than logistic regression with those features, because it's basically the same model, but we have less data to train it. So we can only be, we can only expect expect to be worse. What we would like, hopefully, is to do as good as this. And if we're able to do something as good, then um, well, we would be happy about it. I think. Um, that's why in the experiment, we, I will always compare the results of the random Markov field model with the performances of logistic regression trend with the whole um, an aggregated data set. And that will be a skyline because it's not something I expect to beat, something where I, I hope at best to match the results. Okay, so now how do we train this model? What we, once again, the problem we want to solve now when we train is to find the parameters, theta and mu, which maximize the probability of the event that we observed, which is the random variable d equal the observed aggregated data small d, and the observed sum of labels big C equal the, uh, well, the random variable equal what we observed. Um, of course, as usual, we put a log because it, it makes a nicer problem, but it doesn't change it. And the fact is, if we take this log likelihood, actually, it's the gradient has a quite nice and simple formula. So the reason why is that the model I've presented before is an exponential family for which the aggregated data are exactly the sufficient statistics. So if for you this makes sense, you can for, you can forget this slide and, and the next one. If it does not, I will detail this, and you can forget about sufficient statistics. Um, okay, it turns out that um, the, we can prove that the gradient of the log, log likelihood has exactly this shape. So I have two vectors of parameters, so I have two gradients. And the gradient with respect to the first parameter is simply the observed aggregated cones of example, minus the expectation according to the model of the um, aggregated cones of examples. And the gradient with respect to theta is the same thing. It's the observed sum of label, aggregated sum of labels, minus the expectation according to the model of this thing. So those two vectors are directly observed in the aggregated data. It's exactly what I observed. And the two other um, vectors there are some expectation according to the model, 
So those things do not depend on any data, only on the model. So we could compute it explicitly in theory by making a sum on all possible couples of feature vector and y. The problem is that all the possible feature vectors, if I have, let's say, um, let's have only say maybe 10 features with um, each, it's already 10 by 10. And if it's a bit bigger, it's, it quickly becomes a totally intractable. Um, okay, so that's the formula. And um, at this point, you may wonder, okay, why is it the case? I will not make the full proof, but I will give the idea. Um, here it is. So what we sorry what we want once again is the gradient of this probability of the log of this probability, and it's a complicated event because this is the sum of the probabilities of all the possible data sets which lead to this. So it looks quite complicated. So let's assume that, however, let's assume that we observed the true samples. So all the x and y. It's not the case, but let's assume for now that we observe it. We could then write, if we are just to train the model with that, we would just be able to write the gradient of the log likelihood of this data set, which is the gradient of the sum on all the samples of the log likelihood of one sample. And when we write it, we can notice one thing, which is it's simply the sum on all the samples of the encoding, the encoding of the vector minus something which does not depend on the data. And when we sum those, that becomes the aggregated displays, which we observed, minus something. Okay, so that's the gradient with respect to mu of log of the normalization constant. This thing does not depend on the data. And we had the gradient of the log likelihood of the full set of samples. And you notice that it depends only on the aggregated data, not on the exact assignment of the individual samples. And because of that, um, we can compute the gradient. It means that because um, because the probability of the aggregated data is just a sum of all um, the probability of all possible assignments, we can get the gradient of the um, log of, um, of the event. But basically, there's just a term which uh, becomes a constant, which is removed when we get the gradient, and we have actually the, the same thing as there. Um, so it means that we can compute this directly with the formula which is there. And if we finish the computation, we realize that uh, this thing is exactly um, the expectation there. Okay, so we have a quite nice looking formula to compute the gradient. Is it enough to solve our problems? Um, so before we answer that, I would like to review a few properties um, of this problem. Oh, sorry, slide is not well done, I have an issue. Okay, uh, so the problem we want to solve is uh, this one, once again. We are saying maximizing the log of the probability that uh, of the observed event. So first property, it's a convex problem that could be checked by looking at the second derivative. Um, on top of that, there is a unique optimal distribution. Um, okay, to get this, we need to either assume that all the components of D and C are non-zero, or we need to compactify, which means allowing some, um, some uh, coordinates of mu or theta to go to infinity, or at least to minus infinity, to have some, um, to allow, sorry. Um, but well, that's quite a technical detail. So uh, also, 
the optimal distribution is well defined. The optimal parameters are not exactly because we are slightly over parameterized. But it's the same thing as in the case of the logistic relation, where you can always uh, switch some part of the bias and put it to the weights of the features um, without changing the, the model. Anyway, so let's call pi star the optimal distribution. Um, and I will define an, a set of distribution, which is, I would like to define a set of distribution which verify the properties that in expectation, uh, the aggregated displays are equal to what we observe. So the set of distribution of an X and Y, such that the expectation of the random variable big D aggregated uh, number of um, examples equal what we observed, and expectation according to um, the same distribution of the sum of labels, aggregated sum of labels, equal what we observe. And there is some, um, we have some nice properties on the distribution pi star, which is first, it's a member of the set. And why is it the case? Simply because the gradient of the log likelihood was exactly the difference between this and this. So obviously at the optimum, it will be zero. Um, it's also the unique distribution in the set of models parameterized by the mu and theta as we did, which verify this equality. Once again, for the same reason, because if it's the case, we have a gradient of zero and we have a convex problem, so that will make it unique. Um, and finally, it's also the distribution of maximal entropy in this set of distribution uh, in the set um, P, which is defined there. Which means there would be another way to um, attack the problem, which would be totally equivalent, which would be to say, okay, I observed the um, realization of D and C, and I know nothing more about the distribution. So what I, I would ask two things, one distribution which matches what, uh, what I observed in expectation, and then in the set of distribution which matches this, I do, do not know which distribution to pick. So I will just pick the distribution with the maximum entropy. And we will receive exactly the same distribution. And actually, once again, it's a way to generalize naive bias because um, naive bias is basically um, an hypothesis of independence between variables. And Maximizing the entropy is just the more generic way to have some, um, well, it's a generalization of saying that things are independent. Okay, um, so we have this formula for the gradient. I'm sorry for the slide. Um, and the question is, okay, how do we compute it in practice? Because it's the difference between one vector that we observe and some things, some expectation according to the model, which we said might be intractable. So first we can rewrite it uh, this way by linearity of the expectation, because this is simply the sum of phi of x on n independent samples. We can write this. And to estimate this, what we can do is simply to gather some samples from the model and to average the vectors phi of x. Um, so gathering, to gather some samples of this model, it can be done with some um, MCMC methods. Typically, deep sampling uh, directly applies and is uh, quite natural in this setup um, because we have some um, discrete variables and uh, the law of one, one variable one feature of the vector knowing the others is quite simple, simple to write. I didn't do it there, but basically it's simply a multinomial in the same way that the condition law of the label was um, um, a logistic model. Um, it becomes simply a multinomial, which is um, quite straightforward to compute. So, okay, let's assume that we have, that we generate a set of a set big G of deep samples 
from the model. We can now estimate the expectation there by Monte Carlo. And it gives us the following um, estimator for this gradient, which, which is simply the aggregated data that we observed minus the sum on the git samples of the encoding value of x. And we reworked by the ratio between the number of samples in the true data and the number of samples in the set of git samples to correct, um, well, to get the correct um, expectation. Okay, for the other part of the gradient, we could do directly the same, we could do exactly the same thing, but we can improve a bit by simply marginalizing on the variable y. And so this is the definition. This is using the definition of C and linearity of expectation. And there we marginalize by replacing the true variable y by the expectation of y knowing x. Which is uh, what you already seen before, what we have already seen before, simply a, a logistic of phi of x dot theta. Um, and when we do that, we now compute the average um, well of this on all the GIP samples. And this gives us this estimator of the gradient. So once again, the aggregated labels that we observed, minus a sum on the Gibbs samples of the encoding vector multiplied by the predicted y on this sample. And we reworked by number of samples divided by number of Gibbs samples. Okay, so with this, we have a way to estimate the gradient. How do we train now? And um, the answer, is um, quite straightforward. At least there is a straightforward answer, which is simply generate some samples from the, from the model using the current model's parameters to get a set of Gibbs samples on G. Then estimate the gradient with those samples with the formula we saw before. Then update the parameters mu and theta with the gradient step. Or maybe we, you can apply some preconditioning or typically you can compute the diagonal relation to try to get faster and repeat. And it's a convex problem. So this kind of thing should converge. Only thing is it is painfully slow. And slow typically because the Gibbs sample, sampling there, um, to do it well, you need to make many iterations of Gibbs between each gradient step. And this is just um, too slow in practice. So one, one idea here is that when you need to generate some samples, you can reuse the deep samples that you had from the previous iteration, which are al already more or less um, from the correct distribution. Not exactly, but not too far. And instead of doing some full deep sampling, so instead of doing several steps of the Monte Carlo Markov chain, we will just take the Gibbs samples of the previous iteration and make one single step of Gibbs. And once, once this is done, we'll use the Gibbs samples we get to estimate the gradient as if um, they were fine and iterate. So it becomes update the samples with the model with one single step of Gibbs and apply the gradient with the same formula we saw before. And once we have a gradient, make a step of gradient. So just something to notice for people, okay, people who are familiar with using GIFs sometimes use it to sample parameters. Here we are really sampling data, we are sampling vector x and y, um, and not sampling parameters. Um, okay. So that's the training algorithm. Maintenant, now a few details to, well, to make things work in practice. Okay, once again, this is our model and this is the conditional law of the model, which looks like a logistic regression. And it's quite known, well known that logistic regression are much improved if you had some model regularization. It is especially true in the case when there is a large number of features 
And remember, um, with our one out encoding of all possible pairs of modalities, we have actually quite a lot of coefficients. Um, typically, if we have maybe 10 features and some of the features have um, a few thousand of modalities, this quickly becomes um, several tens of millions of parameters. And also with many parameters, it's really important to regularize. And the simple way, is, the most useful, is just to add some L2 regularization. So that's what we will do here. And the difference, of course, is that we have two parameters. There's the parameter theta, which is the one which appears in the final model, which looks like a heuristic regression. And there's the parameter mu. Um, so we can regularize both. And in practice, it was um, the experiments I did, it was quite important to not put the same uh, strength on the regularization of both parameters. Typically, theta had to be regularized quite um, significantly, basically at the same level as what we use for logistic model with the same features. However, mu was best to to be regularized as little as possible, or at, the, at least clearly less strongly than uh, theta. And actually, the reason for that is that, okay, we really care about the quality of this model, of the conditional model. We do not care about the quality of the model on X, or at least not really, because that's, what, that's not what we're going to use. And because of that, it's actually quite okay to overfit on the vector mu. So that might seem a bit shocking when said this way, but let's, let's make a, a suit experiment to convince ourselves that it should be okay. Let's imagine, we, we had here, we had all the pairs of features. Imagine that we also have access to tables with the triplets, the quadruplets, and maybe one table with all the features. And that we try to fit the model without some regularization on you. In this case, the model will be powerful enough to model any possible distribution because there's a table with uh, all the features. And if we learn without regularization, it means it would fully overfit the training set. And the distribution on X, according to the model, model would be simply a set of Dirac's in the samples of a training set. The thing is, Actually, this is okay because um, it would come back to the case of training a logistic model with um, access to the whole data set. Um, to see this a bit more clearly, let's just compare the shape of a gradient that we have on theta with what happens when we train a classical logistic regression. So let's assume, I, we assume here that we observe the whole data set uh, all the examples X and Y of a data, data set. Then if I write a logistic model, my logistic model is um, defined like this, with parameter theta, and I would write the log likelihood of uh, this model. So it would be just uh, this, the sum of all the possible examples of the log likelihood of the observed label, uh, which is either log of the uh, sigmoid of, or sorry, there's a log missing here, log of uh, one minus the sigmoid. And when we do the computation, it turns out it's exactly the sum on all the data points of the label minus the prediction, which is, um, well, which we multiply by the encoding vector. And this sum can be broken into two parts. We can, in one, in, um, one side, sum y multiplied by phi of x. And, uh, keep the other part on another sum. If we do that, we have a sum on the data set of y multiplied by phi, phi of x. And if you remember, it was exactly the definition of my aggregated sum of labels, the vector c. And the other part is something which is computed from the unlabeled samples x of a data set. So one thing to notice here, which is also quite interesting is that to train a logistic regression, we actually need only the aggregated labels 
and this set of unlabeled samples. So that's something to keep in, which might be worth some time to keep in mind. It's not my focus right now. What I would like to do is to compare this formula with what we, the formula we used for the Monte Carlo estimator using some Gibbs samples uh, of a gradient with respect to theta of the random Markov field model. That's the equation we used before. And clearly, there are some strong similarities between both. In both cases, it's the vector of aggregated labels minus a sum of the encoding vector weighted by the prediction on uh, this sample. And in the case of a true uh, classical logistic regression, this sum is on the set of uh, true samples on the, on the training set. In the case um, of the random Markov field, it's a sum on the Gibbs samples that we have at some iteration. And we reworked by something which tells us that um, the number of Gibbs samples and the number of um, true samples in the model are not the same, so we should correct for this. Okay, so maybe that makes it a bit clearer that it's not true of Gibbs only, because um, if we are able to have uh, the set of Gibbs samples equal to the training set, that would be perfect. It would become the exact same gradient as in the case of the logistic. So of course, we don't have access to all to a table with all possible features. So there will always be some discrepancies between those. And that leads us to one way to try to improve a bit the convergence of the model, which is what I would call the risk scale gradient. So here is the estimator of the gradient once again. And there is this factor which risk scales globally um, between the number of keep samples and the number of samples. And the risk scale gradient, the idea is that um, if I look coordinate by coordinate, if my model is fully trained, then, um, okay, this is the aggregated count of examples. So the number of examples, I, number of examples I see on one coordinate, and I would rescale each coordinate by the ratio between um, the true data and what I have in my git samples. So this ratio and this product um, are uh, coordinate wise. Um, in the case when, I'm sorry, no, I won't go into that. Um, okay, and um, empirically, using this risk gradient instead of a true gradient, uh, I was to just converge um, quite a much faster. Um, okay, a quick slide to say that we have no guarantees that the random Markov field leads to a good model. And um, okay, it's a kind of generalization, generalization of naive bias, which is known to have um, no guarantees when there are some um, dependencies between the features. And we are generalizing this. So do we have any guarantees? And the answer is um, no. Uh, actually, you can even build a distribution on three binary variables where the model fa fails quite badly. Um, so just one side to keep in mind, there are no guarantees. However, in practice, I found it to work surprisingly well. And on the data set where I tried, I didn't at all find this kind of um, problematic examples. Um, so I have two slides of results I'd like to show. Okay, the first one, um, the main data set where I tried the algorithm was something, some data set which was produced by Criteo, where actually we made a public challenge on this topic. And um, so, we took a large data set with uh, 19 features, which we believe were the most, most important for us, let's say. And we computed the tables of aggregated data from a large uh, data set with uh, those features. It was quite large with 100 million samples. Um, we made a public challenge and we didn't want to scare competitors away. So we also included some granular samples. 
so a small training set and a not so small set of unlabeled samples, which was the test set. So if you remember what I said before, to train a recyc regression, you only need the aggregated um, labels and some unlabeled samples. So the winner did exactly that. And it worked uh, quite well. So the model I have, of course, was worse than the winners because it was not accessing uh, those things. Uh, it was also significantly worse than the skyline. So this is the normali normalized log likelihood of the model. Uh, higher is better. And um, Okay, to, so in this, in this challenge, there was some difficulties to make the model scale. Uh, I will have a slide on that later. So the issue is that we had many features and some features with a very large number of modalities, which was making things difficult for us. With a bit of pre-processing, um, pre we were able to get something um, which started to look a bit better. Um, I did not include the results from naive bias on this uh, challenge because typically if you do naive bias out of the box, you get a score less than zero. Zero is the log likelihood of, uh, is, if, is, it is if your log likelihood is the same as the log likelihood of a constant predictor because of the normalization. And then if you start to tune naive bias, you just, uh, you are still, uh, still much, much worse than um, when you train on the small training set we provided, which is a sampling of 1,000 times smaller than the original set. Um, so on this data set, we are um, not fully happy with the results, but it's really, um, well, we would hope to get something better, but it's already quite, um, well, not so bad. Um, I told you I couldn't find any examples with um, um, of the distribution of three features where the model has a problem. What I did is that I tried every triplet of features of this uh, the same challenge dataset. More specifically, every triplet of features where the features are a low enough cardinality so that the model is fast to train. And with every possible um, triplet of features, I made one data set with uh, three tables. And I try to train the random co field, the nice base node model, and a logistic regression with the cross features using the whole unaggregated, unaggregated data. And I plotted the results. So one point is um, a model with three features. And what I could, so on the X here, we have the performances of the logistic model. And on the Y, we have either the performances of nice bias in blue or the performances of the random Markov field in red. What you can see is that the random Markov field and all the triplets I tried here is just uh, comparable to the performances of the logistic. In the case of naive bias, usually it's much worse. There are some examples where the correlations are low and we are not so far, and some examples where it's really much, much worse. Um, to summarize, we observed empirically that it worked very well on data sets with small counts of features, three or for what I've seen uh, up to, let's say, uh, eight or nine, I usually had no problems. And in the case of a challenge, we had nine, 19 features. It was still working decently, but there was, we started to have a significant gap between the performances of our model and the logistic regression. Um, Okay, I have one slide to explain why it was difficult on the challenge. The problem basically is that there are some features with a large number of modalities. And um, yeah, maybe it's time, I don't know. Oh, it's... 
OK, um, which means that the full tables were not possible to compute, actually. So what I tried was to hash the, the cross features to reduce the size of the aggregation tables. And basically, the vector phi was now defined as one on one dot encoding, then hashing. That's exactly the usual hashing trick that is quite common to train a logistic model. Problem is this thing was losing some correlation between features. And it did not work well because the distribution of X I had with this was not correctly replicating those correlations. So what I had to do instead was to do some uh, pre-processing by doing some target encodings. Uh, so for each um, features and each modality, you compute the average um, uh, well, ratio of labels uh, equal to one. And you pre-process the data by replacing the true modality by just a bucket of uh, this ratio. And I made it so in such a way that I still kept as much distinct modalities as possible while being able to scale. So I wanted typically 1,000 buckets for each feature. Because this way, my pairwise tables are of size 1 million which is um, reasonable enough. And um, I was able to train the model. Um, well, I think it's time anyway. So I still have time for questions. Thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I did not see any question during the talk, but maybe someone wants to ask something. I have one or, one or two questions myself, but let's give uh, sure. the audience a bit of time first. No. Well, when, why people are thinking about questions. I wanted to ask you, Alexandre, uh, do you know this uh, method by uh, Geyer called uh, Geyer and Thompson uh, called uh, uh, MC, uh, MC ML, MLE or MC MC MLE? Well, basically, you do maximum likelihood estimation, but your, your uh, model involves uh, an intractable normalizing constant like you. And yeah. what they do is that uh, they use some form of important sampling to, to approximate it. And then uh, to approximate it, you have to run uh, MCMC. Are um, you familiar with this? Uh, it looks like uh, there's a connection between what you do and this kind of method, but... Uh, I'm not familiar with it. Um, I suppose that, uh, okay, of course, the gradient is written as an expectation, so if you have another distribution from which you generate samples, you could um, apply some importance weighting. Um, then uh, the typical issue of importance weighting is to make sure that the variance does not become crazy. I do not know the method, so I cannot tell. Um, mm. Well, in their method, what they do is that they, they use a MCMC sample from a given parameter. And when they have to look at a different part, a parameter, that's why you do important sampling. Uh, I think someone typed something in the chat. No, oh, it was David, right? No, like, oh, we have a question. Just oh, yes. you have the name of a method, or can you send it to It's a MCMLE or MCMCMLE. And you look for okay. Geyer and Thompson. They, they, I'm not saying it's the same, I just see and in, in both cases, we are doing MCMC to approximate normalizing constant sure. in the course of uh, maximum likelihood uh, approach. So they, they looks, it looks similar from a uh, look, but I'm not saying it's the same. Uh, um, I'm yeah. not doing importance writing, so it's not the same, but maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it's totally possible that the, the training algorithm could be improved um, because Okay, um, this thing, it's something which can be found in some old paper from 2008, I think, uh, where I exactly described this. Um, I know that there are some more recent papers uh, on some possible improvements. Actually, I tried a few, but it did not really improve. Not that much. Um, um, we have a question from Julien, actually. Sure. Uh, Julien, um, do you have your mic open? 
Uh, you can try to open your mic. Uh, uh, no, I'm not think I'm not able to open the mic of anyone. Okay, uh, uh, let me look, or maybe you could read first. Could uh, let me read the question. Could redoing the Gibbs sampling once every X iteration instead of a single time at the beginning improve something? Um, so the problem is basically once we have a set of Gibbs samples, the gradient is uh, this and does not depend anymore. Okay, um, it's a good question actually. So the gradient with respect to mu will not depend on um, the parameters. So it will save them, which is not a very good feature. It's true that the gradient with respect to theta could be updated. It's the case because uh, if we marginalized on y, and so we have the parameters uh, theta, which is there. Um, I did not try uh, making several steps there, and it could be the case that it improves a bit. It's a good point. Uh, Julien, I hope you're happy with the answer. It looks it looks like a good answer. Uh, Julien, yes. can you talk? Uh, ah, yes. Uh, yeah, you hear me? Yeah. Okay, that was, uh, yeah. Uh, as the theta was uh, appearing the, in the second gradient, uh, I thought it could maybe yeah. do something. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? Um, no, well, if not, uh, let's thank again Alexandre for a very interesting talk. Thanks, Alexandre. Uh, on behalf of everyone, let me help you.